It's a tumultuous time for European energy and security of supply has suddenly taken center stage. Welcome to the bulking up, building out session of Roundtables Europe, where we discuss solar manufacturing and its future here on the continent. My name is Jonathan Gifford, the editor-in-chief of PV Magazine Global, and co-hosting this session with me today is editor Mark Hutchins. Mark, what do we have in store? Coming up in the next 45 minutes, we will lay out the current state of play for solar manufacturing in Europe and take a look at the ambitious targets Solar Power Europe and the European Solar Manufacturing Council have set. We will hear from Solar Power Europe's Valberger Hemmetsberger, NL Green Power's Nicola Rossi, and solar technologist Peter Hans Schack of Inspection Equipment Supplier Isrevision, and Sebastian Gatz of cell deposition toolmaker Von Ardenna, uh, among a few others. Two panel discussions lined up uh, in just a few moments. First, we're discussing European manufacturing from the point of view of production equipment suppliers, and then we assemble representatives from the manufacturers themselves right across the solar supply chain. But before we get into that, after a decade of decline and some would say stagnation, European solar manufacturing is experiencing somewhat of a revival. Playing a key role in this is industry association Solar Power Europe, which has created a new resource, mapping Made in Europe PV. Valburger Hermitsberger is the CEO of Solar Power Europe, and she joins us today. Hello, Valburger. Hello. Well, thank you, for being, thank you for being a part of Roundtables Europe. Can you please take us through some of the initiatives that Solar Power Europe is spearheading to um, really engender a spirit of, of uh, made in Europe PV production? Sure, very happy to do so. And indeed, you asked me to uh, refer, reflect a little bit on where we stand in Europe today when it comes to PV manufacturing. Um, I see that my, my presentation uh, is shared already. So we are, uh, as Solar Power Europe, re representing the solar value chain, the whole solar value chain, from manufacturing uh, to deploying solar uh, and all the different areas which, uh, which we need in order to accelerate solar in Europe with more than 260 members, out of which we have more than 50 manufacturing, European manufacturing members uh, as well. Um, I think it's fair to say that we really entered a new dawn for solar, not just for solar in, in terms of deploying solar in Europe, but also in terms of European manufacturing. And the landmark uh, publication from the European Commission, which has been published just a couple of days ago on the 18th of May, the EU solar strategy is marking this new dawn for solar manufacturing, but solar also more broadly. What does it bring? First of all, I think it is very important to say that for the first time, we have the political recognition that solar manufacturing in Europe is important and needs to be reshored. We've been working very hard for more than three years now in order to get this political recognition. This is uh, putting us into the next decade of, uh, again, having European solar manufacturing much stronger back in Europe. Europe. What did it bring? First of all, the European Commission was proposing a EU solar PV industry alliance. This industry alliance is based on the European solar initiative that Solar Power Europe has initiated uh, some time back, uh, based on the solar manufacturing accelerator, where we first brought together the whole European ecosystem. Uh, and then together with EIT, Inno Energy and the other partners took it to the next step to the European Solar Initiative. Great to see that acknowledged now by the European Commission, which wants to take it one step further uh, and propose a sub, uh, industry alliance. Uh, great to also see that the European politicians have endorsed the 20 gigawatt of solar PV manufacturing in Europe by 2025. I'm going to dive a little bit more into that in my next slide. And it's also great to see member states supporting uh, an alliance. Some time back already, we had a letter being signed by 10 member states who were asking to reshore European manufacturing. So what does it mean exactly? Where do we stand and where do we want to be? At least 20 gigawatt of solar. That's what the European Commission has now endorsed from the work we have been uh, pushing for in the last couple of, of years. 
what does it mean? You all know that the solar sector is growing exponentially. Uh, we added some 20, almost 28 gigawatt of solar last year. Uh, and what you see here is the further growth path of the solar sector. With the new geopolitical circumstances uh, and with the electric, uh, energy price crisis we are facing, we could even, and that's uh, one of the accelerated scenarios we are looking at as solar power, we could even be at uh, 80 or even 100 gigawatt um, of solar installed by 2025, 2026. So 20 gigawatt compared to the numbers we are looking at in the next couple of years uh, is a sheer fear to be produced in, in Europe, uh, one third, one half of the demand in three years time. Apart from that goal of having 20 gigawatt of manufacturing along the whole value chain, by the way, uh, we also want to see a strategic outlook on raw materials and components to be looked at by European decision makers. Now, where are we now? And you referred to the map we have been publishing in our homepage. I invite all participants to the roundtable to have a look at it and zoom in because you, you can search the different parts of the uh, value chain to see where uh, where manufacturing is happening today in Europe. And this is an, uh, uh, a map which is further evolving. Obviously, the more DVM man man manufacturing we are seeing to come onshore again in Europe. So what, what does it show? Uh, the red bar, obviously, that's inverters. That's where we're still very strong at uh, in Europe. But leaving inverters aside, the polysilicon value chain we are, as you can see, and as you know, still very strong on the polysilicon side. We have a strong polysilicon industry with, in particular, WACA uh, at its core. Um, but what we need to redevelop, and the figures show it, uh, is cells. Um, and uh, we have a critical lack of ingots and waivers. So this is where we need to gear up. And we hope that this map will show many more of this uh, green and of this uh, orange dots in the near future. Because what you see on the next slide is where we are aiming it. So the 20 gigawatt uh, of solar, what you see here on this graph is that indeed on polysilicon, we are already beyond the 20 gigawatt, but that does not mean that we need to, uh, that we do not need to further uh, expand what we have as a polysilicon production in Europe, so some work also needs to be done on that side and, and a critical work. But uh, what is more is that we need to close the gaps uh, we have, and that is on ingots and wafers, uh, cells and modules. What you see here is what the yellow one, the, the yellow bar, what we have today. Uh, the rose one, what the projects are until 2025. The, the blue ones are the ones uh, which are already financed and the projects which have been announced post-2025. So uh, except for, for waivers at this point in time, when we are following the announcements, uh, we do think that uh, the 20 gigawatt by 2025 can be reached if the right framework conditions allow these projects to be, uh, to be really getting on the ground. Uh, very, very uh, importantly to mention is that uh, apart from the announcements we've seen from the European Commission now, putting forward the European uh, PV Industry Alliance, a lot has happened already. Just to mention the Innovation Fund, which already has given a grant of 100 million euros to a PV manufacturing uh, project, the Three Sun Factory, um, which is going to scale up to three gigawatt. This is, by the way, something Solar Power Europe has been working on for months to convince uh, the European Commission that PV manufacturing should be covered by the uh, Innovation Fund. And as we speak, the, we are holding here in our offices a workshop on the future of the Innovation Fund because we do think that Innovation Fund money has to be earmarked for PV manufacturing. The European Commission is just right the, now as we speak in our offices for a workshop to discuss exactly that. Um, and uh, and one other very famous project, obviously, I, I need to mention is Maya Burger also announcing uh, 1.4 gigawatt of cells and modules uh, and will open that anytime soon in the next couple of, of weeks um, after summer. And many more hopefully to follow in order to close these gaps, which I was just showing.
last slide, uh, but very important to mention, the backbone for European solar manufacturing is demand in Europe. And that is the second big, big pillar which we see in the solar strategy and also more broadly in the Repower EU package of the European Commission. We are very happy that the Commission has been following us in, uh, in proposing a 45% renewables target. Uh, uh, 45% renewables up from the originally proposed 40%. So that would bring us very, very close to one terawatt of solar by 2030. And in their own solar strategy uh, and in, in Repower EU modeling of the European Commission, uh, they do think that 750 gigawatt of solar uh, is to be aimed at by 2030. But, you know, 45 percent, uh, one terawatt. And this is very important to support demand in Europe. Uh, be ambitious because this is what is uh, supporting ultimately also manufacturing being brought back to Val, Europe. Val Berger, thank you very much for that presentation. Increasing demand, increasing ambition, the innovation fund, um, and then of course the manufacturers like Enel and Maya Berger who have been a, both a part of our Roundtables Europe event. Thank you for, for providing that overview and for Solar Power's ongoing, Solar Power Europe's ongoing work in the space. Thanks for joining our Roundtables. Just last month in Brussels, we saw the launch of PV manufacturing as an important project of common European interest, the PV IPCEI, uh, which should open up, which should open up, which should open up significant funding opportunities to aid in the development of manufacturing projects across the continent. And our next speaker is very much at the centre of these discussions as a policy director at the European Solar Manufacturing Council. Jugimantas Vaichunas, uh, a warm welcome. Hello, uh, I'm glad to participate in this event. Thank you, Jugi Mansas. So we have heard some, some encouraging words coming from the European Commission uh, recently, particularly this, uh, the, the pledge to do whatever it takes to support solar manufacturing. Does this mean things are now moving in the right direction or do, do more people still need to be convinced? Yes, indeed. Uh, this was uh, uh, longly awaited uh, messages from the European Commission. Whatever it takes, this is the clear direction. The direction is uh, good, but the key uh, things and the key uh, issues is about what will be the concrete measures and uh, how fast these measures will be implemented. And this is actually one of the measures, this is about the IPCI uh, for the PV. Uh, but also today we are talking about mostly uh, the deployment part and, the, and now talking about the PV manufacturing part. So I see that my slides are here already. So the key issue is about uh, what uh, should be done uh, for Europe that we can really uh, be facing the revival of the PV manufacturing in Europe. So, in principle, uh, here we have to, uh, to see very clearly that uh, and to uh, see the reality that in Europe, still, uh, besides our huge ambitions for, for the PV deployment, uh, currently still we have quite a, a low production of the uh, PV manufacturing. So, that's the case that we have only 1% of the uh, solar buffers. 0.4% uh, of cells and 2-3% of modules. And uh, this is the numbers of 2020. And in 2021, these numbers was not even better. It was uh, a little bit better for the modules, uh, but not so much for the other parts of the PV value chain. So this is one of the key issues. And this is uh, now we are facing the trade deficit of 8 billion euros. So with the current PV deployment plans, in case we are not changing the, nothing on the manufacturing side, this trade deficit could increase uh, to 15 or even 20 billion euros. So this is the issue of the strategic uh, reliance of the European Union. And the question is, what are the strong points and the weak points? So in the uh, green color, you see how much Europe is developed and how much is uh, uh, moving forward on the R&D level making financing for the research, development, and innovation, and also uh, agreeing with the fact about the strategic autonomy, strategic energy 
dependency, which is really necessary. But the key points for the PV manufacturing or at the weak points are that we have a really quite a moderate policy to come small offers on sales production. And of course, the key issue is the financing, uh, financial capital, financial capital for the for the operation of these activities. And that's why still, till now we have not enough of the critical manufacturing capacities. So my message here is very clear that automatically we will not uh, be facing the reality that these manufacturing capacities will be scaled up. And the second point is that, of course, uh, we would need really uh, comparatively uh, small investment into this area to ramp up and to move forward for the PV manufacturing industry. So here in the slide, you see that we have several uh, financing uh, possibilities in Europe, uh, be it Innovation Fund, which has, has been mentioned before. And uh, of course, it's, we are glad to see that this Innovation Fund has been extended and the, the financing will be doubled. Uh, we have also recovery and resilience fa facility, which depends mostly on the member states' uh, incentives. And um, we are glad to see that, of course, uh, uh, about 50 million euros has been already dedicated. Uh, and some of the member states like Italy, Romania and others are really moving forward uh, to support the PV manufacturing industry. But uh, also along to this, uh, we have to have other support instruments like the PVIPCI, important project of common European interest. We are glad to see that European Commission uh, really supported this in this uh, EU solar uh, PV uh, energy strategy. And uh, this is really now, this is now the ball in the member states' hands uh, to move forward uh, with this initiative. And uh, of course, it's, uh, uh, we are glad to see that uh, the Solar PV Industry Alliance has been initiated. And the key question is how much and uh, what will be the financing terms for the PV manufacturing industry? So uh, all in all, you can see that uh, almost 10 billion euros will be enough for in, in all these different measures to revive of the European PV manufacturing industry. So that's, uh, that's the issue. And of course, uh, the second point is that um, we have to use all the potential instruments what we have. And as you have mentioned, uh, the important project of common European interest uh, in, in the ESMC, European Solar Manufacturing Council, we have initiated this process last year. Uh, now we have created uh, the framework of almost 60 companies participating in that framework. There are six concrete projects which are dedicated for the innovative, uh, innovative and breakthrough technologies. And uh, uh, the only issue is that we have to uh, make the financing for this project because we see that already now this is about uh, one to two billion uh, financing gap. And uh, with solving this, this issue, we can really expect the competitive, long-term competitive European PV manufacturing production in Europe. And uh, from, from our perspective, we are seeing that at least half or even 75% uh, of all the deployed capacities should be manufacturing in Europe just to ensure the strategic resilience of the European Union. So there, these are the projects. And of course, uh, uh, here you see the, all the partners, uh, now the members of the PVIPCI initiative. Uh, we are glad to see that Spain is uh, prepared to move forward and to take the leadership for this initiative on the member states' perspective. Now, of course, the question is how much of the member states uh, will join this initiative. We are glad to see that uh, some countries like uh, Lithuania, uh, Poland, uh, Luxembourg, uh, uh, and others already joined. Now, the question is that uh, we have just really to streamline our efforts and to move forward along this line. So what we need really and what we are missing in Europe, we need long and cheap money. This time, not for the subsidies, but just uh, to raise the, enough of the capacities for the European PV manufacturing industry. And this is uh, my third message that in case we will do so, we will, uh, we will successfully deploy all the uh, ambitious targets of the European Commission and the member states. In case not, without this, uh, in case we are not uh, really taking as soon as possible uh, these key actions for the PV manufacturing industry, then it will be a risk also for the PV deployment. Because uh, as uh, you have uh, realized today, 
we have really very ambitious targets uh, to be implemented till 2025 and onwards till 2030. So thank you, thank you for for your attention, and I think that this is uh, this is most of the things that uh, really hot, uh, uh, not only summer but uh, the other days are waiting for us for the PB manufacturing industry and the, for from the European Solar Manufacturing Council as representing we are representing the manufacturing part. We are prepared uh, to take over these responsibilities. We even made the questionnaire that even about 60 gigawatts capacities. Uh, could be installed quite soon in case we would have the financing for the uh, PV manufacturing of, for example, 1% interest rate. So this is one example that really this mission could be feasible to be achieved in case the competitive financing con conditions could be ensured. Thank you, Zhugi Mantas Vajinas, from the European Solar Manufacturing Council. Well, it's time now to take a look at some of the technologies that will be or indeed already are driving European solar and to move into our first panel discussion for this session. Jonathan Gifford has more details for you. Thank you, Mark. Well, it is encouraging to see all those innovative projects coming forward. And Europe is very much home to a number of solar leading uh, laboratories. And Europe has plenty of know-how when it comes to deploying uh, high efficiency and high tech PV products and manufacturing them here. And of course, a key part of that equation is the vibrant community of production equipment suppliers with the ability to kit out the solar farms and the solar fabs of the future. But they faced strong competition from Chinese ri rivals in recent years, and only the strongest have survived. But I'm very pleased to welcome two of the strongest to Roundtable's Europe stage today. Please welcome Sebastian Gatz, the Vice President uh, Photovoltaics for Fon Ardenna, and also Peter Hutchuk, the Managing Director of IsraVision. Gentlemen, thank you very much for joining Roundtables Europe. Now, before we start the discussion, I just want to um, provide a little bit of information about both of the companies. With production equipment suppliers, it's often a bit difficult to know exactly what part of the technology supply chain they are supplying. They're brands that's familiar to many of us, but I just wanted to give a very short overview. So if we could quickly bring up a slide or two. Germany's Isra Vision supplies in, in uh, this is von, von Adena. Von Adena uh, is a German company that manufactures, manufactures process equipment for industrial coatings, including thin film solar and the layers deposited onto silicon for high efficiency high efficiency silicon PV cells. And IsraVision, also from Germany, supplies inspection and machine vision, vision equipment to more than 12 different industries in terms of solar. They supply lines all over the world to allow manufacturers to closely monitor their inline processes and the quality of their end products. So again, Sebastian and Peter, thank you very much for joining us. Thanks for having me. Okay, Peter. Uh, well, no, actually, firstly, Sebastian. Um, we've seen some of those projects um, from Solar Power Europe, NL, and Maya Burger. Um, they're both pursuing heterojunction technology, but on the cell uh, on the cell level, that we're also seeing a lot of motiv uh, movement on Topcon at the moment. Where do you see the kind of landscape in terms of cell technology on a European level? <laughs> Yeah, thanks for the question. So um, let's let's start with P-type PERC, right? Uh, the, the standard technology right now. There are three main reasons why it's difficult for new players in Europe to compete with the existing Chinese PV cell and model with manufacturers on this. The first one is the wafer supply, right? China has more than 400 gigawatt wafer production capacity and also controls the P-type wafer supply. The second one is the cost for the PERC cell production. So uh, they utilizing uh, in China the learning curve from more than 300 gigawatt in the production capacity for standard PERC. And the third reason why it's difficult for P-type PERC production in Europe is coming from the technology. Uh, basically, the theoretical limit of PERC cell structure uh, uh, is almost reached, so there's no large room for improvement on this one. And therefore, N-type technology is coming into the game. So uh, this is a the remaining chance, I guess, for European PV and model manufacturing uh, to compete with PV manufacturers in Asia. 
Okay. Uh, well, so, well, how do you see then heterojunction or top gun? Both N type technologies. Yes, that's correct. And and both are still uh, niche markets, right? So today, compared to perk uh, 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 technology, but both have the potential for high efficiencies. Um, um, and for Topcon, it's a reasonable choice uh, to have existing per for customers who have existing uh, perk experience. Um, the um, the, the beauty of heterojunction on the other side, it's a simple process step. There are only four process steps, major steps required compared to seven to nine for the Topcon approach. And this uh, results in a clear cost reduction roadmap on this. Uh, so it's easy to operate in the heterojunction fab, uh, lower uh, labor costs, I would say. Um, the space for heterojunction is smaller compared to the uh, Topcon approach. And uh, there are no, uh, or almost no toxic gases required for heterojunction 24 7 production. And at the end, the overall CO2 footprint for heterojunction is lower and therefore also more, sta more sustainable compared to other technologies. Okay, thank you, Sebastian. Peter, over to you. Let's look at scale then. We heard earlier today in Roundtables Europe, you know, the vast scale of the Chinese manufacturing industry in terms of PV is really quite ominous if you're an upstart European manufacturer. Um, how, can, how can that kind of challenge be overcome or at least can competitiveness be approached by European producers at a much smaller scale? Oh. It's for sure a very important uh, cost factor uh, or cost uh, re reduction factor. And uh, if you cannot start with large scale at the beginning, you have to find the reach, uh, the, the, the right uh, niches uh, with high efficiency, with uh, technology leading. Uh, or leading by technology uh, modules or, or cells or whatever. And uh, I think uh, over the time, there's no way uh, to avoid a large scale. I think, I personally think uh, in the next years, the upscaling of European PV manufacturing will be, of course, the most important factor uh, for the cost competitiveness. Okay, so scale, nothing trumps scale, but what about if you were involved in a PV line uh, project, designing a PV line, how do you think that they can be executed in Europe and, and executed at the, at the quality, but approaching the cost competitiveness required? Well, uh, in general, in Europe, uh, we have a lot of, very high, exp highly experienced uh, and uh, technology-wise leading companies. Uh, what I think is missing is some, let's say, a turnkey approach, especially in the, in the cell manufacturing. We are working mainly in the, in the cell uh, manufacturing with our inspection tools. Um, I do not see any uh, European uh, turnkey supplier or, or turnkey provider. Uh, and I think this connecting frame is still missing. And this is for sure one of the most important parts uh, that have been done in the next couple of years. Okay, so turnkey reply, uh, you know, in applying to one manufacturer or one equipment provider that can provide all the different process steps or coordinate oh, the different not, steps. Not only uh, can provide all by its own, mm -hmm. but someone who can uh, bring all uh, expertise together. Okay, so a kind of turnkey lights can coordinate um, yeah. the installation. Exactly. Okay, excellent. Thank you for that, Peter. So an opportunity there. Well, we did hear about the European projects. NL, of course, um, just a little while ago, we had Intersolar Europe and on the show floors amongst the produ production equipment suppliers. Um, Sebastian, I met you there. There was a lot of energy, a lot of excitement as um, the different winners of those NL contracts uh, were either gossiped about or made announcements and the kind of news came out. How, how, how important do you think um, that it is that 
Europeans are supplying these European projects, or do you think that there will be really tough competition from the Chinese production equipment suppliers? Because, of course, they've developed a lot of expertise over the years. Yeah, you're right, and um, uh, for sure, uh, the competition is there, um, uh, also in Europe, with Chinese equipment supplier, and we cannot negotiate, uh, 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 say, ne neglect it. So uh, there are equipment suppliers, as you mentioned before, outside of uh, Asia, which are still uh, on the market, which still are competitive. And in general, if they are there from the Western world, I would say they are the benchmark, right, on technical and technological levels um, for their respective process uh, steps. And as mentioned before, there's no not a turnkey available right now in, in Europe. That's a big uh, topic and uh, advantage is, uh, in, in China. They, they have turnkey approach. However, um, I, I would suggest to form uh, of, of this experience um, equipment suppliers to form a team of the strongest, right, with their experience and know-how, with uh, technical technology advantages, which they have with the reliability, also with the financial strength they have, and the collaboration on individual R&D roadmaps together with the institutes all over Europe, uh, which are there, which are uh, 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 the front runners in the industry. You you know, in the past, Perk was developed in Europe, Topcon was developed in Europe, Peter Junction was developed, and right now we see, uh, saw it also today in the morning, HZB and Oxford P. They're driving already the uh, tandem technology. So, uh, know how is there, uh, but we need a, a team of the strongest to bring this also to a gigawatt scale. Yeah, well, we've seen in some of the projects um, that the European Solar Manufacturing Council was talking about today, these teams are forming in terms of trying to advance projects and also working with NL, um, maybe to a lesser extent with Maya Burger. So are we seeing these teams coming together? Peter, do you have any insights there? Uh, yes, at the moment, um, the most contacts are, uh, yes, in current projects uh, and May it be industrial projects like the some uh, new manufacturing projects um, as Inel or Mayaborga. Or, of course, there's a, a lot of cooperation in some funding projects and some uh, research projects uh, driven by some uh, research institutes. And this is the main way how we, mm. how we come together. Um, uh, but what I said is, uh, this both is driven not by the production or, or by the by the equipment suppliers. It's driven by the end customer or driven by the um, by the research institutes. And uh, my feeling is the the uh, equipment industry, the the uh, equipment suppliers need to cooperate also more from their own, mm -hmm. maybe also driven by some uh, turnkey suppliers, turnkey consultants or whatever. And of course, we also benefit from some uh, cooperation in international markets like India or, or in, in okay. China. Of course, where we also cooperate with European suppliers. Mm. Okay, well, we just have a few minutes left. We hear about, you know, the labor, labor costs. Energy costs are a big, big lever. Labor costs are another lever. Um, how important then will automation be in designing these European production lines? Uh, I'll go to both of you on this question um, and, and also kind of reliability in production as well. Um, both of you, you have about one minute each. Um, Sebastian, I'll go to you first. Yeah, automation is one thing and uh, scalability is the other thing, right? So if you compare it when we sold our uh, PVD system for hydrojunction, for example, three years ago, it, it gave you a throughput of 250 megawatt. Right now, we are selling and producing and providing uh, equipment for up to 1.2 gigawatt per system, right? And this scalability comes with, uh, for sure, less labor work, uh, automation is a very important topic, also in the pr full production flow of a gigawatt uh, fab. And also here, uh, uh, there's a lot of IT, IoT uh, technology in, in, in Europe available. So I think there's a big chance uh, with this big uh, uh, support of, of the whole value chain to, to, uh, to make a profitable business in Europe, uh, because at the end, it's all about profitability uh, for, for the industry. 
Mm, okay, thank you, Sebastian. Yeah, so scale can be achieved by some of these modern production platforms more easily than in the past. And Peter, in terms of automation, there's something we hear in Germany is this industry uh, 4.0 approaches. How, how widely can they be employ employed in the solar fabs in Europe of the future? Of course, I think this is a main factor for uh, cost reduction. Yeah. Uh, this uh, industry 4.0, uh, this uh, data analysis, this uh, fab-wide uh, data management, this is, of course, uh, I would say, an advantage that we have in, in, uh, in Europe. What I see is, uh, from, from my customer uh, experience, uh, there's much more focus on, on this uh, central data uh, management, central data analysis, uh, and structured data analysis in Europe, in European uh, manufacturing lines, than in, in Chinese fabs, for instance. Yeah. Mm, okay. And so I think this is a a big advantage that we can that we can use here in Europe to build up our own production. Okay. Well, I think that's a good message to finish on Sebastian Gatz from Fonadena, Peter Hunchuk from uh, Isra Vision. Thank you, gentlemen, very much for your time, and thank you for joining Roundtables Europe. Thank you. Thanks. Bye-bye. It was a pleasure. In recent years, we've heard plenty of plans for manufacturing in Europe, and now in 2022, these are becoming a reality. Ground has been broken at the Tango project, NL Green Power's three gigawatt heterojunction cell and module factory down in Sicily. And we are joined by Nicola Rossi, head of innovation at NL Green Power. Uh, and joining Nicola for this discussion from the opposite end of Europe is uh, Carsten Rohr, Chief Commercial Officer at Norsun, which is producing silicon ingots and wafers up in Norway, uh, and also has some impressive plans to ramp up this capacity over the next few years. Uh, well, Nicola, first of all, 3 gigawatt is, is a pretty big announcement, uh, and this project in Catania is already one of the most advanced, I would say, in this wave of new manufacturing in Europe. Can you first of all take us through the timeline of the project? Yes, th thanks for the question. Uh, the project has already started. So it started uh, last April. So we will have in the first 17 months, uh, the ramp up up to 400 megawatt uh, manufacturing capacity. So by September next year, we will have this uh, capacity uh, in operation. And in the following 10 months, so basically by July 2024, we will have full capacity, so three gigawatt. The overall investment will be in the order of 650 million euros, and the Tango project uh, was awarded with the Innovation Fund, as, uh, as uh, you probably know, so we received approximately 120 million euros uh, as funding for this project and additional funding uh, uh, up to 180 million euros approximately by, by national government. So that's that's the time schedule. In parallel, we are carrying out a very, let's say, ambitious development roadmap. So we want to achieve tandem implementation by the end of 2025 in order to get efficiency up to 30% respect to the today efficiency that is in the, in the range of 24, 25%. Uh -huh. And uh, Carsten, ingot and wafer manufacturing currently is, is one of the least established PV supply chain segments in Europe. Could you, could you give a little background on the current situation and, and also on Norsan's plans to, to ramp up new manufacturing here? Yeah, sure. That's uh, absolutely right, as you say. And as uh, Sigi Montes was pointing out earlier, um, ingot and wafer production is um, only about 1% in Europe uh, uh, as, as a fraction of the global production. Um, and uh, that uh, has uh, more recently, of course, become uh, more of an issue um, uh, coming to focus. Uh, first of all, because, uh, of course, the, the um, PV is becoming an important energy source. And that's, uh, that was on the agenda a long time, really. But uh, more recently, um, through COVID first, uh, the logistical part uh, with the disruption has uh, become a focus. And then 
uh, also the economic part uh, through the reconciliation through the recovering resilience uh, facilities um, and uh, lastly of course uh, the the war in ukraine which put the focus on uh, becoming first of all accelerating pv but at the same time not uh, de becoming new dependent on um, china uh, getting away from dependence from russian oil and gas so that's uh, clearly put a focus on producing um, in europe as well and uh, we, we have um, in North Sound, we are approaching one gigawatt of capacity, and that is, of course, uh, very little um, compared uh, to some of our Chinese uh, competitors and in the context of the global production. And we are uh, planning to increase our capacity uh, substantially going forward uh, to five gigawatt at least, and maybe even 10 gigawatt. Uh, so we are currently in the uh, phase of uh, um, looking at the, the business case to and the uh, more detailed planning for such an expansion. Uh, and uh, Carsten, quickly, can I ask what what sort of time frame would would you have for this full five and then ten gigawatt expansion? That's uh, the lead time is roughly uh, two years uh, to uh, get uh, started uh, with the ramp. Um, so we're talking twenty twenty four roughly or for start of the ramp. Mm -hmm. And uh, Nicola, well, we, we heard from a couple of uh, European equipment suppliers just a moment ago. Um, we also know that NL has chosen European suppliers for much of the, the equipment to be used in the, in the Tango project in, in Sicily. Uh, what, what was behind this decision? Yeah, behind the decision, uh, the reason for that is that we, we do not need just to build a factory in Europe. We need to build an ecosystem that is able to make the factory operation possible and that is able potentially in the future to make this sector growing in Europe. Uh, you know, we are uh, basing the, the, the energy transition in Europe on technologies like PV that are strongly based in Asia. 98% of wafer production is in, is in Asia. Most of uh, uh, the, the, the cell production is, is, is in Asia. So uh, Trisan factory is a fantastic project, uh, but uh, in order to uh, to be really competitive, uh, uh, we need uh, to create a, fr a framework. So we, we, it is a sort of anchor project, an anchoring project to make uh, other parts of the supply chain, including manufacturing of, uh, of, the, of the tooling machine that we use, but also uh, the raw materials that we use, uh, make uh, all these different sectors reshoring Europe possible. That's the, the, let's say, the, the rationale behind our yeah. choice. And I totally agree uh, uh, with Nicola that we need to build the ecosystem. We need to build the whole value chain. Uh, so that's a concerted effort that's required uh, to, to bring back all that manufacturing uh, uh, base. Uh, and also the, the, a common vision. Um, and that's where, where the politics are, are uh, really important. Um, so that there's a long-term uh, view that we're going in the, uh, together in the right direction. And uh, so that uh, companies and investors uh, have the security uh, for, for planning. Um, so the uh, policy efforts uh, through the, um, that Sigmund Manchas was mentioning, um, uh, that uh, we are promoting in the European Solar Manufacturing Council, uh, they, are, they are part of that picture like the IPSE uh, to bring together a whole value chain, right? Um, that's, that's just one of the examples. The research projects bring together many uh, different partners, uh, etc. And we need uh, other supporting uh, policies as well. Mm -hmm. Okay, and Carson, sticking, sticking with the technology side for just a moment, um, on the, on the ingot and wafer side, do you, do you see European companies able to supply the, the factory equipment needed? How, how important is it for on the equipment uh, uh, side of things to have European partners providing technology? It is. Uh, we would like to have more. Uh, today, a lot of the uh, equipment uh, suppliers, especially on the ingot uh, pulling side, uh, are uh, Chinese and Asian. Uh, but uh, I think uh, over time and with that uh, common vision, I think we will uh, create the incentives uh, that uh, more European suppliers will, uh, will become available as well. 
And, uh, well, and Nicola, also, as well as not only the technology, there's, there's the materials to, to think of as well. Um, do you, how do you see the outlook for NL to source? Source the other module components like glass, encapsulants, junction boxes, also from, from suppliers in Europe? Yeah, silicon is for sure the first and most important material in a, in a, in a PV module. But of course, there are other parts uh, of, the, of the bill of material that are relevant. So you mentioned some of them. Glass is for sure one of the most important. Uh, what I see uh, is that uh, the, the impact of logistic on glass is very important. And so to have a, a European glass production supporting the European PV industry uh, is a plus. Is a plus in order to reduce such a kind of cost. We have a number of companies that today are uh, operational in different sectors, like for example the automotive sector, and could identify uh, the PV sector a way to scale up their production and differentiate also uh, the, the, the sectors they are they are serving. So that's uh, that's really an important point uh, for us to build the the, 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 the European supply of, uh, of this material. Regarding junction boxes, I think it is more a commodity. Uh, but I see the possibility to innovate. So introducing into the junction box uh, power electronics that can uh, make the module operation even more efficiency, efficient. Uh, and it is a sector where we are working with some of the European, uh, let's say, technology providers. There is another field that for us is very important, that is the field of other materials. So encapsulants, uh, silver past, and other kind of materials. So here there is a lot of room to innovate in order to increase the performance of such materials and also to reduce their cost also by uh, implementing circular economy model. So that's also another sector where together with European manufacturer, we can uh, uh, work and uh, we can innovate in order to increase uh, the competitiveness. And uh, Nicola, looking a little further to the future, what, what other developments can we expect to see on the on the technology side? Yeah, uh, a development, uh, as, as I told, we, we see a lot of development in the in the in the material side. So what we are uh, targeting is to go behind that heterojunction. So heterojunction is 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 already a pretty innovative technology in this in this uh, in this area. But uh, our target is to uh, achieve the implementation of tandem technology by 2025. So we have a technology development roadmap that is already ongoing. Uh, we are working uh, with a strong and large ecosystem in order to achieve this target. And uh, our target is to achieve 30% uh, cell efficiency by 2025 in production. So implementing the technology into our production line. Okay, well, we are about to run out of time. Uh, one final quick question uh, uh, to you both. Now, we've heard quite a bit about policy support in this, in this session. Uh, what, what types of incentive would be most valuable to you in, in ramping up capacity even further? Uh, to Karsten, first of all. I think we've already heard quite a few uh, points on the financial support, which is absolutely uh, clearly necessary. Uh, I would like to include one additional aspect uh, of policy support, which is on the environmental side, uh, where European manufacturers have uh, an advantage, uh, being uh, have higher environmental standards. And uh, in particular, Norsan has an advantage uh, producing in uh, Norway with clean um, hydropower. And that's, that's something that should, uh, the policy framework should be such that that becomes an advantage rather than a disadvantage. And uh, so the carbon footprint, for example, uh, uh, should be uh, um, promoted and included in policy uh, frameworks, like the French have done for many years in their tenders. And uh, there is efforts on the eco design to include carbon footprint. But of course, it needs to be uh, a strong and strict uh, policy to support that. Okay, uh, and Karst, uh, Nicola, sorry, uh, a couple of words on the on the policy environment to to close this session. Yeah, we, we absolutely need policies to support the sector to scale up because we have uh, to be aware that uh, we compete in a world where, especially in Asia, we have big player already uh, uh, having achieved a big scale, uh, vertically integrated, uh, that have received uh, uh, support, public support in order to reach that scale. So for sure, we will need the support. We started from, from a, a, an interesting starting point because we have uh, some instruments already in place and thinking to innovation fund uh, and uh, our factory uh, was awarded with, with innovation fund and thinking about uh, a national programs or so recovery funds. 
Uh, I think we need a couple of things, more flexibility on the existing instruments, uh, and we need uh, some more focused and dedicated instruments in order to the risk, the scale up process, uh, looking not only to innovation, but also to, to the scale up uh, and looking uh, also uh, to, um, uh, to the overall supply chain, not only cell and module, but the overall supply chain that we need. Uh, so EPCI, has, uh, I think, uh, was a good experience in other sectors, like, for example, the battery sector and more recently in the hydrogen sector. So to have dedicated instruments like this could for sure support uh, the industry to grow and to reach the scale. Okay, well, we'll have to leave uh, this discussion here for today. Thank you very much uh, to Carson Raw of Norsun and Nicola Rossi of NL Green Power. Uh, and that was the Made in Europe bulking up, building out session. And it is certainly going to be exciting watching these ambitious plans and projects come to fruition over the next few years. Uh, thank you once more to all of our speakers, to all behind the scenes here, and of course, to our audience for joining. Coming up next, I'm going to go and have a lie down, but Jonathan will be back this afternoon with the PV on wheels session. That's taking a closer look at vehicle integrated PV, still very much a nascent industry segment, but one that is growing rapidly and seeing plenty of innovation. Before that, we'll take a quick break during which you have the chance for some speed networking or to meet some of the speakers and sponsors in the expo area. We're back with PV on wheels at three o'clock CEST. Don't go away. <laughs>